I think we have a now very good set stage set up to have the discussion flowing more. So uh, before I start, I just, it's a little commercial, and I would say I would like to acknowledge a group of people in Novartis working for the last six, seven years to implementing all this design in a practical basic. I mean, there are almost 100 trials we run on these methodologies. And it's only few who are the primary contributor of this book chapter, which is coming out in 2015. But there are a lot of clinicians, there are a lot of senior management people who really hand on hand with us to make this thing true in the real life trials. So here is a quick outline of my talk. I will just give a quick introduction, which will be really quick because many of the parts are already you know from before talk. Then I give a quick phase one design framework in combination domain. So main, the, the topic of my talk is when we move from single agent to combination, life becomes even harder, especially in phase one setting. And that was basically the framework and some methodology that we worked on and we implemented uh, with two case studies. I try to go through the case studies to see how this methodology work and their real life trial data with some implementation mentioned issues that's basically is also with FDA, EMEA, all the questions that we came up, we answered, and some concluding remarks. So without any further delay, we, you already heard all this. I mean, we are in a very complex setup where we try to find a good MTD, but we have a small sample, the trial has to be rapid, and I mean, there is a word adaptive, but it's, it's natural. I wouldn't say it is adaptive, it's actually natural in this setting. And the idea was to give a general a, a methodology which can combine our clinical knowledge along with the statistical knowledge. So here are the few things, and, and especially in a co when you think about a drug combination, there are a lot of things start to fall apart. You don't have a monotonicity in your dose response curve because you're not in a line anymore, you're on a surface, firstly. And the monotonicity doesn't hold. But still, you have the same problem of phase one that you need. You have only a small number of patients for each course cohort. You have to determine the MTD correctly. You have to look into the patient safety. That means you cannot expose too much patient into the higher dose. And also, you need to get a good dose to go on. And you need to have a flexibility in the design which can help you to optimize the feature. And by feature, I don't only mean operating characteristic. I mean the patient's benefit, clinical benefit, everything together. So here is what it comes, comes in, like this three plus three design, we see a lot of protocols. In common, it, it is bad, as we already heard that, I mean, I had to use that word bad, and there is no statistics, honestly, in three plus three. It's, and it's even bad in combination setting, where the uncertainty is even more, because you're not in a line, you're in a surface now. You don't know exactly which direction to go. 3 plus 3 is have an only fixed level. It cannot give you any direction on that plane. And that may cause more and more failure. Now, what, so then it comes basically to the model-based approach. And when we went into the model-based approach, the Bayesian framework came very natural to us, which is similar to the CRM concept. I mean, it's not nothing new. The, the Bayesian methodology has been used in this method, both the publication, the, the, the earlier publication by O'Quigley, later on by Gusheng and Young. There are a lot of publications, because the main idea was what is actually the matter of interest? The matter of interest in the DLT rate given the data. It's not the point estimate. It's not, basically we, we, un, we want to model this underlying estimate, which here, given that you have a very sparse sample size, and also some data available, maybe Bayesian is a very appealing approach because Bayesian is a way you can have the probabilistic statement along with the other evidences to combine this together. There are other approaches, but this is something we, and of course, this type of method which many publication now shows 300 or 400 the numbers, and you see every paper has a simulation, and you can see this model-based approach are performed much better in detecting the MTD. Oh, here is total, I mean, I just expanded the graph that Navi showed, actually. So there are two parts in any of the dose escalation, I, I would always say. The first part comes, which is the model and the inference, which is statistic, statistician role. You use a model-based approach, you use an MPI, any method, but this is where we lie in. But the other part is come with a many other components together. 
And that has to be taken into account when you are taking the dose escalation decision. So you look into the DLT rates, you try to model them, because it's a small sample size, the uncertainty. And the major problem in 3 plus 3, which does say the, the experiment was about this explosive, which is repeatable if you do it. There is not much uncertainty because it's an experimental setup. But patients are not like that. If you repeat the same three cohort of patients, you won't get the similar kind of output. So the uncertainty is a major challenge on that domain. That's why model-based approach and statisticians come more handy. So here is the first, I start with a simple model, which is a single agent model. And now I guess though uh, East actually included it in the Escalate module. Uh, it's, it's called, it, they mentioned it NCRM, which was primarily based on the paper by Bayard Nan Chander in 2008. And the model started with a very simple one. So you have a binary endpoint, one or zero. So the natural model is a logistic model. And so which I assume, again, a monotonic in the curve because you are in the single agent setup here. And the parameter, the parameter interpretation of alpha and beta are very natural because logistic models are very, very much used. We know the physical interpretation of them. And uh, we can actually look, and, and, and you can also add, if you want to adjust it with patient level covariates, that can easily be done here. In drug combination, things are getting problematic now. I mean, it's not exactly in this setup. We are not in a monotonic setup. You may not have a unique MTD anymore. You may have a region on that surface which satisfy your criteria of maximum toleration. That was the first challenge. The second challenge come in that, of course, the monotonic is a problem. Second is how we escalate, the direction of the escalation. Depending on clinical interest, and purely statistical direction. The model can tell something which has clinical has no interest on, or a company as a development perspective has no interest on. So then we need actually something which is flexible. We need to have a parallel cohort so we can expand it in both direction to decide what is optimal. Then also it summarizes the knowledge of, we, we need to know at each stage, given the data, what is how my surface should look. Can I predict the surface overall? And then also, it can incorporate the other information which can choose the best dose for the next pair. By best, it doesn't mean one here. In combination setting, it could be more than one. Now, what makes combination so difficult? Because, I mean, you have one drug, you, you know other drug, why I, we cannot just model them separ separately and look into each of them? Because the problem is when they're different animals when you combine, we all know when you combine them, it not remain the same animal. You have all this peak exposure comes in, the toxicity comes in, you have a lot of this overlapping interaction, pathway interaction that makes the toxicity looks even worse. <coughs> so here is the method we, we try to expand our methodology. I, I go to the very high level here rather than going into the details. So uh, we try to expand our single agent model to the, to the double and the triple combination model. So far we handled double and triple only. It may be more than that, we haven't handled it yet. So for a double, if you think about it now, so if, if you just think about statistically into the problem, we, we looked into this way. So for a combination, you, the first assumption that all the model assume that you can separate the single model agent, inform, agent effect and the interaction effect. That separability is the first assumption that we came in. So basically, both of them, you can try to model the single agent separately, and the combination separately. This is where the fun fundamental assumption comes in. So when you can separate them, we go back to, again, the single agent model to model the single agent part. But then the model is still not complete because you need to still model the, the interaction. So for a dual, it's easier because you have only one interaction. So one parameter adding to that will actually help it to, to get the interaction done. But for triple, it gets even more harder because you have dual interaction and you have triple interaction. In order to cover that surface, when we looked into the data and we tried to cover the surface, actually so far we found four parameter model which is fitting the surface much better. But again, as I mentioned, we are, for the triple combination, we are still on a learning phase. We are trying to learn more. This fundamental idea was actually an extension for Peter Thal model, who used a six-parameter model for the dual interaction, dual combination model. 
And uh, so, so basically, when we implement it, we find some issues. So the extension is actually came from there, the idea of separation. And, and here are the few nice features of the model. Firstly, it's parsimonious in the number of tested dose in the combination trial is very small. You need that criteria. Second, you can easily interpret the parameters because it's an exactly similar interpretation, that nice NCRM or two-parameter logistic model. You can look into the marginal effect over the time and the interaction on the same time. And then it allows the interaction. And the beauty is you now can actually incorporate the single agent information to increase the precision a little bit. Because you have this marginal effect where your prior can play an informative role. I'm going to the prior in a second. I will go more details on the prior, how we get it. But first, we have a model. That's nice. But how we take decision after that. So primarily, we looked into three primary metrics for the decision. First one was uh, the posterior distribution. Of course, you try to look into posterior distribution of the target toxicity and overdose toxicity. So if you look into the overdose toxicity, you don't want to go there where overdose toxicity is very high, given your current data, the probabilities. And, but the, the problem is clinician, and we usually use the EWA criteria. So we look into only with the feasible doses at a given data. We run the model. On the candidate dose levels are the one where overdose criteria is less than 25%. So, and, but the problem which we face, that the, when we talk to clinician about all these posterior, underlying parameter, two parameter, it's become very fuzzy to them. So we try to talk to it in a patient perspective. That what is the risk? So, so this is the try, we, how we try to communicate it, that if I put an end patient into the cohort, into this new cohort or the current cohort, what is my probability of getting R toxicity? That is a nice way to quantify the risk. We usually call them like a base risk there, which is not formal base risk. It's not a base factor or a utility function approach. It's, this risk is telling them how much toxicity they expect actually on that domain, which helped us a lot into the non-statistician communication because they really not sometimes understand what underlying true parameter or what the things are. But in a nutshell, they understand here is the risk we are talking about. You put three patients, you have 40%, 50% chance of seeing two out of three toxicity. Should we choose this dose or not? And of course, what uh, Navi just said, the other part is the formal decision analysis. But so far in our real life trial, we haven't used much of the utility function approach, except 0, 1, which was kind of a, we looked into posterior distribution of the target interval and the posterior, and the overdose toxicity interval. Now, the question comes in, I have a similar sparse data situation, but I have a much complex model. How can I gain the precision here? How can I make the model inference better? So the question, what we started to think about, but we have few data in hand. At least you, you know this single agent data, toxicity data. Can we somehow borrow that information into our model? Or think about how to incorporate it? Of course, the best choice is you have a data, you don't want to use it. Okay? I mean, that's the that's a, that's a most conservative way to doing it. And then basically you end up with a new trial. But then you can also think about borrowing it, like a full hold it. So the second example, which I said, basically you concatenate or augment two data, which may be risky because your, your, your inference could be very much done by the previous data. So you need more uncertainty when you borrow it. That's a classic meta-analysis problem that we all faced in different phases, that how we combine information. So one of the approaches, so if you look at the Stein paper in 1990, 1995 or 1955, I think, in, in Annals of Statistics, it's, it's actually they talked about this in between, the complete pooling and no borrowing is a hierarchical modeling. So we started to take an approach of hierarchical modeling, how we borrow the data inside. And there's actually a recent paper published, which I also co-authored and Beat together in, in DIA working group, we discussed more about it as well. There are multiple publications we talked about this method. So here is in a nutshell. I have a data with me, which is a DLT data. DLT data out of some pay, Y1, Y2, Y3, which is number of patient, number of DLT. And the idea was, this is my parameter of the historical data. And what could I actually talk about parameter of my new trial? underlying distribution of the parameter of my new trial, which is theta star, and how we can do that. So we're using a random effect meta-analysis model to do it. 
And this is, we named it meta-analytic predictive approach or map approach. So it, it, it's, there are many other literature in this context. People talked about power prior, people talked about commensurate prior. But, I mean, with the, with the mathematics done, we can actually show the equivalence between them. It's, but the, the beauty of the map prior, the interpretations were very simple on that. So now coming back quickly, how we implement it in a phase one level, what data we have. So if we are in a f first, so, so in, it, you have two components. One component may be experiment, that means we already know some data. And the other one, maybe we don't know anything. We only know some preclinical information. So there are two sources of information that we need to uh, get into it. So if we use a preclinical, the idea was basically uh, discount is as much you can because the similarity between animal model and human model is always a question or a, or a debate. And, and also in this discussion, you need to include clinician. That's one of the success I always say in, uh, we have in Anavatis. We really made a very active dialogue so our clinicians came into to the similarity between trials. And then also, if you have a single agent data, which is a first in human data for those, how you incorporate them, and we can use this, and uh, you can uh, actually have a moderate or substantial discounting of the data to incorporate. But at the end of the day, you need to, I mean, I can talk about prior, right? I mean, prior is beta, but I mean, for a non-statistician, that's very hard to understand how we quantify the prior. I mean, what we borrowed in. So we actually used an approach which is called prior effective sample size. You have seen a lot of publication recently. So somehow we try to quantify it using a prior effective sample size. There are many different approaches, ratio of the variances. You can approximate, so we are talking about a distribution P. We can approximate the distribution, look the quantile. We can look into Satoshi Morita method, which is more complex for hierarchical model. But somehow this helps us to know that what we borrowed, how many patient information we actually borrowed into the trial with the historical data. And when basically it's usually very small, like three or nine patients. So as much you start to accumulate data in your real trials, three or four cohort, basically the likelihood is going to take the decision, not the prior anymore. If you make strong prior, there are other problems as well. As I mentioned, so the, for the single agent, we try to use uh, the data from whatever we have available for the single agent. For the interaction, we try to use the simulation data. Sometimes they have this, uh, this preclinical SIMSIP simulation data that they perform the preclinical group. Also, sometimes we don't have a data. So we usually try a prior which is pretty wide, allow for a wide level of interaction, like the odds of DLT with increase with the, with the combination, we allow it go to like, at the middle, like 10% to the maximum, something like threefold or fourfold. Now, I just quickly finish this because of the, of the time. So uh, the point was, there is always a discussion. Do, do we choose the right prior? What if the prior was wrong? I mean, it's been a wide discussion already. And we already know that all your characteristics can have a problem if you have a prior data conflict. So one of the, there are many, there are a few literatures that have been discussed about it. Recently, we published one in, uh, in, in biometrics. Basically, we looked into the mixture approach. There are a few other things. People talked about the T distribution which looked into the heavy tail. And another way to do it, the mixture prior. So you actually have one component of the mixture coming from your historical data, and the other part is completely non-informative. That way, it can take care of this prior data conflict a lot, make your operating characteristic better. So now I quickly come into the application where I need to show you two case studies that uh, among the many innovatis. So, uh, that this, so, but when we started into the application zone, there are a few questions came in. And the first thing come in, where should we start in combination? We know where to start in single agent, we start at the lowest. We know, but where in combination? We don't want to start at, again, go back to the, all the old small doses of single agent. Maybe that's sub-therapeutic already. So one of the rule of thumb people use is 50% of the MTD, but that's not the best way. So the idea is, can our data speaks about it, rather than really making this kind of rule of thumb? Then the second question, what kind of interaction we should take? Should we take synergistic interaction? That means that DLT should increase, or the antagonist, or the independent. So we allowed a prior, which is basically a normal prior on that interaction surface, which allowed both the possibilities. 
if you really strongly think you only believe synergistic, that means your DLT will increase by combination, you can only look into log normal or exponential, which will be on the positive domain. But that's sometimes we didn't see, so that's why we just made it more generalized. So here is very one group, one uh, case study I like to discuss. So it's, it's a dual combination study in Novartis. I took out the compound name because my company don't allow that. So, <laughs> so, so looking into these two data, so, that, so that you have uh, compound one and compound two, and we are the interest, the, those, those level of interest are three, four, five, six, and eight milligram for the compound one. And here are the, uh, and this uh, seven, dose, seven or eight dose levels for compound two. And as I mentioned you earlier, and also Nebi mentioned it, the main idea was to looking into this interval toxicity probabilities. That means when we are here, oops, so basically we are talking about 16 to 35% is the target toxicity. That means where we want to land up with, because that shows some activity on the patient. And also, we don't want to land up too much. We don't want to escalate in this red region, which is more than 35%, which is overdose toxicity. Also, we don't want to go to tail end, because then the drug actually has no activity at all. And we use the UR criteria to determine, uh, to restrain our movement to the, uh, to the overdose toxicity region. OK, so now the actual dose decision. The decision which is stated in the protocol, which is stated in all the dose escalation manual, that the doses that comes with UR criteria, that doesn't satisfy UR criteria, cannot be considered for the escalation range. So a statistician, what he does, he basically, at a dose escalation meeting with the data, he runs it. He provides clinical, this acceptable range of doses. And then there are other data comes into consideration before starting the next cohort. And usually we try to use cohort size of three to six, maybe instead of exact three, because the thing was, if we start with six, there may be dropouts and other reason, because they are very sick patients. These patients already fail all line of therapies, right? There could be disease progression, there could be other reason. And then we actually end up with something like a reasonable three, because one is really something we don't expect either. Something we try to avoid, cohort size of one. And we only allow, so, so at one level, we just said, we can only increase one compound, and you cannot increase more than 100%. These are not related to model. These are more for the safety measure of the patient. And with the efficacy you have there, the actual building decisions, do you statistically include that, or how is that uh, relevant information? No, this is only for the DLT, actually. The whole domain, whole matrix in terms of DLT. It's not a combination. The model is only for DLT's modeling so far. Not for this model-based approaches, no. Because the major problem is if you have three toxicity out of six, you don't have a scan for those patients. I mean, we try to do that, but we end up with one data almost. I mean, the data of efficacy, because it's a first cycle DLT, so four cycles. So once patients drop out, they don't have scan anymore after that. So here is the decision of the MTD rule. So at least you need six patients to be treated on that dose. Uh, there are trials which use nine as well, but on this study, the six was used. And then it, it, when, you, when you consider actually an MTD, basically you at least have to have a 15 patient in the trial, or your target toxicity is more than 50%. There are trials, you can increase this confidence as well, but that will increase the sample size, of course. Now, when we started designing the trial, so the statistician contacted, the trial statistician contacted us, and then uh, we started discussing that how we incorporate the single agent. That single agent is already looked into. They have the single agent MTD, they have the data. So the idea was we have both single agent data, how we can incorporate it. And as I mentioned you earlier, that we use the meta-analytic approach to, to have informative prior for the single agent part of the combination model. But for the interaction, as there were no data, we actually use a pretty wide prior. Now here is how the actual data look. Before I actually talk about how the model worked, I will just quickly talk about here is how the actual data look. The actual data actually uh, come up with, it started with three, 400, and then it proceed on as the, as the design suggested. We little bit convoluted the data 
because of the clinical team aware of their publications and stuff, so a little bit convoluted, the data, in terms of number of subject, but the, the true integrity was there. <coughs> so as I mentioned to you, how the decision worked in the model. So it's not now rule of thumb anymore, the starting dose. We looked into, this is, this is a very nice graphic that we generated for them that basically talks to you at each interval, each, each dose combination, so the agent two is on the x-axis and agent one on the x-axis, what are the probabilities of different interval toxicities? And then they choose the one which is three, 400, which talks a reasonable starting dose because your overdose toxicity is on a reasonable range and it's not too high. So once we have the data, we ran the model. The model says, basically it's allowed, again, now here, it's not one dose level. You see the whole plane together. So eventually the clinical team started, this is the fl flexibility of a model-based approach you can't get in a three plus three, which basically allowed you to start two parallel cohorts there so that they can explore both the directions on the same time, that which direction it more, more they can go. And then they started to see the data <coughs> And again, the model run, and, and basically this is what they seen on the second stage, and we reran the model. And the model was telling us that given the data now and the pride that we have, we can't go towards this region. We, we little bit need to confine ourselves. So clinical team decided to stay on the same dose, actually, that's what recommended by the model. And then they also continued onto this. Now as my time is short, I quickly just say how the MTD came in. Eventually, if you look into the data, once they finished the trial, there was three possible candidates of MTD, uh, as the model suggested. This is reasonable toxicity, and also you have a patient, uh, reasonable number of patients. Then all other information eventually came in about grade two toxicity, other efficacy information, which we use a separate model to look into. And then, uh, based on all the information, clinical team decided to go with 6400 as their R2PD. Similarly, also, uh, this book chapter in here, we also discussed about a triple agent, which is actually a two-stage dose escalation. Fortunately, I do not have a time anymore to continue that, but uh, the, the, it's basically a two-stage. First, you start with MTD of two dose, agent one and two, and then you continue the next step. And uh, this is basically show how the model recommends at each step for the dose level in the triple combination which is a reasonable recommendation we find so far in practical. And we also look into the operating characteristics, as you mentioned, how many times patients were, patients were allocated in different interval target, overdose, underdose, and it shows under the prior, and even under the more extreme situation, the operating characteristics are reasonable. And just quickly look into this few very vital issues, I would say. I mean, the model and the statistics is beautiful, but th without this part, we would never have that success. It's this implementation part, which we, our discussion with clinicians, our expertise in Bayesian statistics, the computation component, how to communicate in a protocol level, and also how to go with the review board, like FDA, IRBs, and all the, uh, all the EMEA questions. So you, we, we, really, we really think that this is our experience is you need an open dialogue with clinicians. Try to get something which is more easy to actually explain them. The predictive probability, look into different scenarios on the model recommendation so that they understand much better. Not go into too much statistical details or the probability statements of underlying parameters and start this non-statistical language and common sense which we developed maybe after a lot of iteration, we, because what we thought trivial was not trivial to them, eventually we gathered. And of course, you need the statisticians who are devoted to work on this Bayesian domain, and it needs a lot of computation. Our primary work was WinBugs plus WinBugs and R. Also, we worked in ZADS, but now this new generation of STAN came in. There's a new generation statistician using the STAN more and more, which is a new generation deep sampler, they call it. This is in a person. I'm sorry? This is not a human being. No, 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 this is actually done by Andrew Gelman and their group. <laughs> so it's a, it's a, I mean, they call it Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which is a new generation of this Gibbs sampling. Also, study protocol, it needs to be stated very clearly. Try to avoid more technical details in the body, but it can go into the appendix to, for the statistician to review more. And so far, these are the few things that we got from regular. It's now basically we are, it's, the hiccups were at the beginning, but now it's more regular. I mean, FDA, 
we have mo all of our protocols, we never have so far the issues anymore, right? It's pretty smooth. But these are the typical types of questions we get, why we use EWAC, why, how we open basically, how many, uh, so it says how risky it is, which operating characteristic can answer, and basically some of the other safety restrictions that they ask us to implement. So as I mentioned, so this is basically a, this book chapter and this talk is about this whole concept about what are the key features. I mean, it's not only statistics, but statistics plays a huge role, but also the practical implementation. And uh, it's basically, it's, this book chapter summarizes our all 10 years of expert experience, I would say. As I just recall, my boss said it's been about 10 years now. So also the technical implementation that we did in-house. And here are the few key references. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>